And we're live, guys. Just so you guys know what you're doing. Hey, Joe, nice hat, by the way. Thanks. My <laughs> uncle sent it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Who else got a hat? I did. Hi, Joe. No hey, Joe didn't get one. No hat. It, I didn't get a hat either. It, it's very strange. Like, the Mets reach out to me and you, Joe, a lot. Yeah. And nothing for us and we got these two bozos getting hats i don't get it yeah. it's because we have crayons yeah <laughs> it's because they know i can't afford to buy a hat of my own yeah, so starving artist over here <laughs> starving artist I, I know you i know joker you're upset because it wasn't a pony i wanted a pony i really thought they were sending me a pony or a large dog <laughs> I don't know, something <laughs> Something you could put a, a, a saddle on and ride. It was for my daughter, you know. You want the <laughs> pony. Every girl should have a pony. <laughs> I had a pony. <laughs> Poland. <laughs> Poland. <laughs> it always comes back to Seinfeld, I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> Why would people leave a country filled with ponies? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let, we'll cut down on the, the comedy for right now because I want to ask you a few things. What do you think about the trades, Mr. DeMeo? Uh, I mean, pretty exciting to, to get a superstar like Lindor and a number two, number three starter in Carrasco, who frankly would have been better than any non-Bauer free agent that they could have signed. Uh, I think it's a coup for, for what they got him for. Uh, obviously, Jimenez is a good player, and he's going to start at shortstop for Cleveland right away. And Ahmed Rosario, I think, is going to find a role in Cleveland, too. I think he's got a... He's got to just be a little more flexible. Uh, his trainer kind of implied last month that he only wants to play shortstop. Well, I think he needs to grab a couple other gloves and, you know, show some versatility. I think he could be a valuable piece. And then prospect-wise, uh, for SNY.TV, I put out my top 20 prospects every year. And I rank Wolf and Green 8 and 9. And this is a bottom – and farm system in baseball where we stand today. So trading guys that I do like. I mean, second round pick, Josh Wolf in 2019. Uh, third round pick, I'd say, Green this past year. Uh, you know, I like them. But in a system like that, you can afford to move those guys to get a bona fide superstar like Lidmore. And then a pitcher like Carrasco, who at his cost is even more of a value. I mean, $12 million a year for two years. Uh, really, really good work by the Mets. And Obviously, the most important thing is when do they sign Lindor because they better not let him even smell what free agency is. He better be locked up well before then. Can I just tell you, I actually feel like I might be feeling what the Seattle fans felt like last year. Like, oh, we got rid of Cano. We got rid mm -hmm. of, you know, Diaz. You know, we still like Diaz, but look what we got back. You know, yeah. with us, I'm like, hey, you – are you sure you guys are okay with taking what you're taking? That's it? Yeah. Good? Yeah, sounds great to me. It's a weird dichotomy where where it's we're usually the ones getting fleeced. Right, for sure. And, you know, that one, I think Steve Cohen just happened to buy the team at the very right time. I mean, we're, we went into an unprecedented year with COVID and all the money supposedly lost by teams or – they're saying that at least, and you had an owner that didn't feel any of that. And not only did he not get any losses by owning the Mets because he didn't own them yet, but he also made $1.5 billion this year. So, like, this is a guy that's <laughs> doing quite quite fine, and the the finances are, are nothing to him. So he's able to take advantage, and that's where I, I kind of want to see him continue to go. Uh, they – they're going to stay under the luxury tax. I'm fairly confident that they're going to do that. Uh, they could go over, but I think you're looking at next year is uh, after season's new CBA. And when you go over the luxury tax, you pay the little fee, which they won't care about. But there's an extra penalty when you're a repeat offender. So if they go over the tax again next year, then the fee uh, the problem could be bigger. And in a new CBA, we don't know what they're going to, they may change the penalties. The penalties could get even harsher. And what if the luxury tax even goes lower next year? It's possible that with 
the way the money is going in the game that the tax doesn't rise to drop. And if that's the case, you have Cano as of now coming back in the books for 20 million bucks next year. You have to decide what do you want to do with Michael Conforto, Noah Syndergaard. So those are two guys that if you know things go well for them this year, you're going to consider what to keep. If that's the case, you have to be, you have to be smart with what you do financially from here on out. So like Chris Bryant is obviously uh, the hot rumor right now, and I think you can make it work, but you're going to have to say to the Cubs, look, you have to take Familia back. And, that, and that's just it. Like, you have to push some money back their way because I don't think the Mets will go over. And they have about 26, 27 million. Kind of depends where you look, something like that before the tax. And I, I don't see them going past it. And they have a couple other needs. They, they'd like to get some back in starting pitching depth, I think. Uh, they have interest in Brad Hand, certainly for the bullpen and other left handers that are out there, too. And center field is obviously something that they want to consider, even if even if not an everyday guy. Maybe it's someone that is a platoon kind of situation. So there, there's different ways to do it. But I think what Sandy and Porter are doing that I think is a good thing is they're just playing the market. And that, that's the best way to do it rather than just saying, we need a center fielder, go get the best center fielder that you can get. You need this, go get the best you could get. They just said, they didn't need a shortstop, right? I mean... You wouldn't perfectly content. I'm sure all of you agree. Like if Andres Jimenez was the opening day shortstop, you wouldn't feel like the Mets were bad at the position. And no. they just had the opportunity to get a qualified superstar at a cost that made sense. So play the market. And I think that's what, what they're doing. And, you know, they're not done that's for sure. And we'll just see if there's anything major left or if it's kind of, you know, more depth pieces that just, help out a bit on, on the margins. Yeah. And you know, this is what I love about having you around. You know, all that stuff you got the three of us are just like, yeah, keep, <laughs> keep talking to us. Yeah. Keep talking to us. We love I, I just want to draw them, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, hey, let's, let's get some better. Let's get some new guys here to draw. You, you like Chris Bryant? Who, who do you want to draw next? Springer? Or what do you want? The Springer. I think I yeah. want to draw him. Yeah. <laughs> he would be nice. <laughs> I mean, Lindor, I'm, I'm very excited about the deal, especially for him. Mm. Um, I'm a little curious what you guys think about, like the, especially the younger crowd saying this is the best Mets trade of all time. You know, I've been seeing some tweets and I'm like, whoa, you know, let's, yeah. let's take a breath. I mean, it's great. I, I'm, I, I can't believe yeah. we got him. We got both of them, you know, but uh, for what we gave up, especially, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> You know, I said that to Keith earlier. I was just like, we got. A, I I think of it as a steal. Like the what we got in return was like, the, not a player to be named later, or not more of like, <laughs> wait. Well, I'm always used to like the same crap with them. Like, We're you know, on this end of the deal. Like, this is like, wait, what team is what team are we rooting for? Like, right? <laughs> it seemed like, oh, man, wow, that is good. I mean, best trade of the f- history. I don't know. That's a bold statement, but. People tend to get a little bold and goofy on social media these days, so <laughs> that's that's not too shocking of a uh, of a thing to say. But now I, I think in in recent, I could say in recent history, I would say it's definitely one of the top ones. I would say, but who yeah. knows what's going to happen? And we were all stoked to get uh, Cano and um, God, my mind is even who's, like, why? Who's we all? Who's we yeah, all? I guess to say, man. Get Cano. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, and um, yeah. I'm yes. drawing a blank yeah. on his name. Yeah, yes. and it's like, but well, what happens when they come here? Like, they might crap the bed. So you have these names that just because they were good in one place, I always like I. It's like that stigma you always feel like, oh, yeah. oh but they're only going to hit 200, and they're only going to play 48 games. It's like, please stop that. We're <laughs> used to the, we're used like, to the good. Mets uniform being kryptonite. You know, like right, oh, yeah, going to yeah. happen. He's going to fall in the dugout. Something's exactly. going to happen. <laughs> You know, it's like oh. he broke his leg brushing his teeth. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> Come, on. <laughs> Come on, not again. But I don't know. I'm I'm excited. I, th- I feel like aside from Cohen and then a trade like this, and I, he's not. They're not going to be done yet. I, I feel it's, it's it's a good vibe, man. It feels exciting, you know, to to be a Mets fan. But that's corny to say, like <laughs> because it's always like, oh, finally, I'm, I'm I'm pumped up to be a Mets fan. But it's like, well. Yeah, I don't know. You got to live through the dark ages to see the, you know, 
the good stuff. So hopefully this is like a turnaround. I feel like it's a lot of good positive pieces of the puzzle. And an owner, I was saying to Keith earlier, like that he he interacts with fans more in the last what two months than the Wilpons did their entire time being the owners of the Mets. Like it's just it's a different vibe. It's cool. I love it. it it's, it's good to be winning in the off season, you know. Yeah. When when do we do that? Yeah. Uh, ever. <laughs> Now, now getting back yeah. to it being like the the best trade ever, I think it's the the young ones that you know love the black jerseys because yeah. they that's what they were born into. They don't they're too young for Piazza. They they um kind of remember Johan getting traded here, but Piazza was like uh, an organization changing player. Yeah. yeah, and that made the Mets more more like bona fide again. Yeah, you know getting Lindor it's great but they had a lot of good talent to begin with you know it's not like they were changing the organization too much when Piazza came back the Mets went from pretenders to contenders even though it didn't look like that way at first when he was you know first here I think Lindor is that kind of game changer he obviously has to do it right like I'm not gonna sit here and say this is the greatest trade ever but if you can tell, I can tell you it has a chance to be one of the better trades in Mets history if he comes and performs like I expect him to. Right. And, you know, I talk, I was talking on my podcast, That's So Mets podcast, uh, the other day. And, you know, it's probably the biggest trade since Santana. And Santana was a game changer, too, when he mm-hmm. came on. It was it was kind of short-lived. He didn't have the longevity. You know, he started getting injured. But when he first came here, that was an absolute game changer at that time. I, like I remember being in Shea at the what was it the second or third to last game of the season when he threw the complete game. I think it was 2007 when they were when they were going back when they when they were trying to not uh, not tank away the the first place and he threw that gem at Shea and I remember that place like rocking. It was the big difference maker, but it just it just wasn't long lived and. A guy like Lindor, if he is what he always has been, and th- then this is a guy that's gonna be a game changer for the next almost decade, and it's that puts it on that you know piazza type level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see what I was saying, like with Lindor is he's I have a feeling he's gonna if he signs, he's gonna be a great player for the Mets. With yeah. Piazza, the team was a, a joke, like a total joke. Like the last couple of years, the Mets, as usual, when the Wilpons own, they never got that player that put them over. Like they got Piazza, but they never had the player that put them over to become champions. Now with Cohen, you know that he is going for those players that are going to put them over to be champions. So Lindor, I hope he becomes as pivotal of a trade as Piazza. But for right now, I still think Piazza is one of the 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 big big ones and Lindor is probably maybe 1B 1C because even the Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter stuff in oh, the yeah. trades in the 80s yeah. that was another one that, that changed the changed the, the team I wasn't alive for it but from everything <laughs> I you know everything I read sounded awesome <laughs> yeah Keith from what I understand is Keith Hernandez or maybe Gary Carter those are probably the two greatest trades in Mets history right which is that what you guys would say yeah. Yeah, I would yeah. I would say that and then I would yeah. say, you know, I would actually say between the three of the three of them with Piazza, they're all like one one A, one B kind of thing. Yep. And I think Lindora has a chance to be in that same group. Right, exactly. He just has to do it. Like we're we're looking back on how great those players were for the Mets. We're projecting ahead with Lindor. So he's gotta come here and do it and from everything that I've learned about him, it seems like he is going to be a New York kind of guy. I don't think he's going to be a guy that, you know, wilts under the pressure of New York. Yeah, he's going to be great in the locker room. I mean, from what I've yeah. heard and read about the guy, you know, he's a personality. Yeah. He's fun. Yeah. So we got a, a comment from Adam Lutter. I hope I'm saying it right. But Cespedes was a big deal, in my opinion. Helped the Mets go deep. I think he was a, a – a major trade, but I don't think it was a huge, you know, um, organization changing trade. I think it did good for that run in the playoffs, and then they never should have, you know, signed a more than that one year deal. 
at the moment it was it was a, a pretty big trade yeah he's right and then it kind of you know yeah. so what happened so yeah it, it was a big trade but i look at it kind of like you said as like uh a piece to help in the in the race for that year that's really ultimately what was it about whereas yeah. the other trades that we're talking about we're talking about potentially franchise altering for a, a lengthy period of time and yeah. that's been super impactful and Holy hell, that I love watching Cespedes play. When he was healthy, he was so energetic. I loved watching him for the Mets. But it's just another one of those things that was super short-lived. Yeah. Yeah, the, the stories I heard about him behind the scenes, though, during that World Series, I think I told you guys. I'm not going to say it here, but there was de definitely if he didn't pull some of the stuff he did, he, I think the Mets would have been a lot better. Yeah. Adam, it gave us hope for that year. Yeah, Adam, it totally did. You know, it it really went from another LOL Mets year to the Mets in the World Series. So, now I'll definitely give you that. It, it, and that kind of just shows how winning the offseason is everything, right? Like, going into the 2015 season, I didn't think the Mets had any chance of being a World Series contender. And then the way they played in May and June – you definitely didn't think there would be a World Series contender. And then they, they turned it around, and Cespedes came in and obviously kind of put him on their, on his back and got him into the playoffs. And then, of course, you had Daniel Murphy in the playoffs who really kind of carried them to the World Series. But, yeah, no, it, it was obviously a massive impact. And, it's, I mean, the Mets have made the World Series two times in my life, so that's one of the two. So I'm going to, you know, always appreciate Cespedes for helping me get there. Stop making me feel so old. <laughs> doing it on purpose right i know yeah me too <laughs> but i was uh i was 10 when i actually saw the mets win the world series so at least i have something a, on you guys that's a, but that I was like three. such a great <laughs> i was 11 <laughs> so I, was, I was 12 in 2000 so for the 2000 world series that like me that's like a great age like you're still a kid but you're old enough that you actually understand what's going on so yeah. to me like the 2000 world series will, will always stand out to me because that was like the first time and then obviously it's against the yankees and you know i half my friends are yankee fans so it was a unfortunate end to it but it was super fun leading into it and watching it with them and, and everything yeah 2000 world series i was just working in production for a year that was my first year, and then we had a big party, a World Series party at the studio. It was pretty awesome. And, you know, half of them were Mets fans, half were Yankee fans, and just the going back and forth was great. And I don't know if a lot of people know what that real Subway Series felt like from that year versus the, the yeah. in-season Subway Series. Like, there was actually something to win besides yeah. just bragging rights. And The city the city bars were just crazy, intense. Oh, it was, like, yeah. It was crazy. And Joe, since that's like your error, are you a black jersey guy or are you, you know? No, I uh, I think the black jerseys. Oh, sorry. Which Joe? <laughs> you, you. That's both. He's both. Joe. You're Joker. Okay, I'll be Joker. Joke. Yeah. You take it first, Joker. You were talking. No, no. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I get confused. I hear Joe. I'm like, wait, he's the pro. <laughs> Go with him. I'm just design Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm give or take. I, I don't really, I don't have like some super attachment to them like they're fine but i think the mess jerseys where they stand are perfect like i wouldn't change a thing i like the pinstripe home i like the gray away and then the alternates are really good and then especially the away alternate i like the away alternate a little more mm -hmm. than the home alternate because mm -hmm. you have the gray inside the new york and then the gray inside the ny on the hat like to me the mets jerseys are like perfect i, I wouldn't change a thing but this, for me, this year would have been, if there were fans, would have been the year to do, because 28th anniversary of 2000, this would have been the year to do, like, Friday night Black Jersey Day or, or Saturday night Black Jersey Day, whatever, for this season, kind of like they did in 2016 for the 86 team. Like, mm -hmm. that that would have worked for me. Like, I don't need them to be back in, you know, circulation on a normal basis. Hey, it looks like we sound good and look good. I don't know if but I look good. I don't know good, if I look good. But. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> – I don't think I look Thanks, Steve. <laughs> but, yeah, like 
you know, I have that stance with the uh, the jerseys where I don't want to see the black jerseys in the rotation. If it's like once or twice for the year, just to, for a big game or you know, a celebration of a milestone, I get it. But I can't see that back in the rotation because it. J- since I'm such a jersey collection collector, if you look at like the way the colors are going across the the you know the blue, the white, and the orange, it just looks kind of. It's just kind of like messy, and and especially with the hybrid cap, everything looks purple. It doesn't look like it's the the right blue. So that's my real problem with it. Not because it's a black jersey, but it just doesn't look too great, you know, together. Um, we got another jersey aficionado, Jesse Burke. On the 2000 team, wear the black jerseys for a weekend. I'm fine with that, but not in the rotation. Black hats. Yeah, the black hats too, which – which there's no hybrid, you know, no blue going across, just the the black. They're all black, yeah. Yeah, because with the hybrid, everything looks purple. Yeah. So, yeah. Does anybody give, has give anybody got to see the style guide? Uh, Joe, what? can you the style guide, Say the MLB again. style guide, which tells you the uh, the jerseys that are coming out for the next season? No, I, I haven't had it. I haven't had a chance to see it yet either. Oh, I thought you were gonna drop like some bomb on us. Like they're going purple yeah. polka dots. Like what? <laughs> it's orange, orange jerseys. Yeah. I, I wouldn't mind the orange would be cool. Why not? I, I actually, I really liked when they did the little league jerseys like that for that weekend when they did the orange jerseys. I, I really liked that. I thought that was, but just for a weekend. I, I, I don't think I would want to see it more than, you know two or three games at the most, but I really, I like that. That was a cool little fun thing to do, but I, I don't know. I'm one of the minority stuff that I like the black jerseys. I think that they were cool. I kind of, <clears throat> I, I know what you're saying. Like would they, it was a little bit sloppy looking, I guess, even from like an art eye or whatever, looking at it. It's a, it's a bit much going on, but I don't know. I kind of, I, I liked them. I don't know. I, I wouldn't have a problem if they brought them back. Like you said, if they did it one day a week or yeah, a weekend you know. or something. Yeah. But it was, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any hatred for the black jerseys at all. I, I would definitely wouldn't mind seeing them come back. But like some people who want them back full time, that's, that's a bit much. Cause you know, like Joe said, I think the way that they're set right now is perfect. I love the alternate home blue jerseys. I think that's like, or with the racing perfect. stripe, the original, you know the racing stripe that Joey Paints actually, I believe, designed. Yeah, um, yeah, those that's, that's, that's New York the, colors. Yeah. You know, um, the black look, the black jersey. I, I said it before; it's a it's a lazy design. You know, from a design point of view, uh, you right. put black with anything, it makes things look awesome. And everybody yeah. was doing it for a while in the eighties, the nineties. Everything had the black background. You know, the Islanders. I don't even like the black jersey they 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 were using. Um, I just think the blue and orange works so well. You know, so but white castle black hamburgers jersey. are awesome though. <laughs> <laughs> well, the black jersey, like you, you like them at first, and then you know, later on, you you regret having the white castles. <laughs> yeah, the next day, the white castles. Not that it's hurting a little bit. Yeah. How about the white uh, on white on white jerseys with the with the nicknames uh, on the back? You need special yeah, glasses to read the name. <laughs> 3D Those jerseys. We should have 3D jersey with the 3D glasses. And the, the thing comes out at you, you know. You see the numbers in your face. Let's do that. Something. Get on it. We have the technology. And the ownership. Yes. <laughs> see, Chris Maloney says the 2000 team, please. Yeah, you know, we do the whole uh you know, the whole bring the 2000 team in for to honor the 20th anniversary since we couldn't do it last season I, i'm fine with the black jerseys for stuff like that yeah. so who um, from the two, if they had if they had a 2000 team day so like they brought guys to the park and walked them out and you know all that stuff who from the 2000 team would you like to see most now just come out in a jersey you've seen piazza so like is that you like you don't need to see that you know, stuff like that. Who who would you like to see? Bobby Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> but he has to wear the disguise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like work out from the dugout while creepy and just like kind of stand there. 
Jesse, I reached out to Glenn and Rush and Hampton, and they're both in. Hampton, you know, I, I don't know if I'm excited to see Hampton. I just wonder how old his grandkids are and what school they want to go to since, you know, that's their whole reason why he went to Colorado with his hey. kids. Got, got us David Wright, so it worked out. <laughs> it's true. Um, I, I, I like the, always like the, the characters, like, Agbayani and that's who I was gonna say. Benny was my I love Benny. Mm. Timo Perez was a guy I like a lot. <laughs> Benny, yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, those guys are great. Armando <laughs> Jesse wants Armando Benitez. I have one of his <laughs> actually have one of his jerseys. <laughs> Shocking, right? Um Benitez. Yeah. Maggio, what about you with the uh two thousand team? Who'd you want to see? Uh, I don't know. I, I guess it. I mean, it, it, it's probably just Piazza. And so anytime he's just such a staple, like to me, like that was he was just like a, like you said, he was a game changer for the franchise and everything. I just like when I think of two thousand two, I always think or not two thousand two, two thousand as well. Um, it, it's just him and um, with Schilling in the bat and like ready to just kill. Like that's always like the first thing that comes to mind with that whole like era of the Mets thing and like that was kind of you know my 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 funky teenage years of of I don't know if I was gonna be uh you know an artist or or a sports guy or something. So it was kind of like uh you know wasn't really huge for a couple of years following them but like like ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one, you know, still like liked it, but I it just always comes back to Piazza for me. I don't know why. It's I guess it's cause I think maybe even now as an adult, it's like one of those things where he's like the one guy where I, I, I painted stuff from him and it's like, that's like the one lone autograph. I like go to spring training and I always miss him by a day or I miss him by like 15 minutes. So it's kind of like, I don't know. There, there's some pedestal. I think I hold him on as stereotypical and cliche as it might be for that era, but it kind of just is, is what it is. Like that's just, he's to me, he was the face of that team. Just like if you, if I go back to, you know, even like, David Wright era, like David Wright was the face of that specific team in my mind. Like I always kind of pick one person to focus on and, and stick with them. So to me, it's, it's definitely Piazza, but I still want Valentine to come out with disguise on. <laughs> what about Fonzie? Yeah, no, he's a close set. And I think it's also because he was so damn nice. <laughs> and that him at QBC too. Like that yeah. would be, that, that would be awesome too. Like he's and Turk, Turk Wendell. <laughs> yeah, for Wendell. But yeah, no, I'll, I'll, yeah, Fonzie's cool, man. That that I don't know. I think I think it's because though it's like still like that aura of Mike Piazza. There's just so what is that? My, uh, yeah. I actually just tweeted a picture of the paint. I was going through like my paintings the other day, and that one for some reason wasn't like in my like portfolio thing. I was just like, what? Why is this not in here? And it was during the uh, like the Mets said tweet. Uh, tweet a picture of you like with a player or whatever it was. And I was like going through my paintings and looking at different pictures. And I was like, Oh my God, that was like one of my favorite ones. And for some reason he signed it sideways, but I kind of like it. <laughs> it makes sense <laughs> for some reason, but no, I would still stick. I would stick with Piazza. That's, that's my stereotypical answer. <laughs> I got another name. Olerud. Uh, John Olerud. Yeah. Well, because yeah. you don't see or hear anything from him anymore, and it would be yeah. great to see him. Extremely underrated first baseman, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was incredible. Yeah. He was incredible. That was a, that was a great defensive infield. I mean, oh, yeah. Rayo. I mean. Yeah. That was one of the best. I mean, weren't they on the cover of uh, Sports Illustrated? or? Uh, yeah. Was that the greatest yeah. infield ever or something yeah. cover? Yeah. yeah. Uh-oh, yeah. Keith. Keith, where did you go, Keith? Uh-oh, we lost the point. He's gone. We lost the point. Joe, you're on the point. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? Keith, come back. So, um, this. it would be, uh, I'll, I'll throw Al Leiter out there too, only because he lives in my town and right down the street from um, my house is Leiter Field. So, him, his brothers, his I mean, oh, grandfather, he, father, I like the whole Leiter. There does. it is. Yeah. The evidence. Of course he has it. Exhibit A. But if it's like if I wouldn't run into him at like Shoprite, then that wouldn't be. <laughs> so, Whenever so, I like, see lighter, I always think of Scott Casimir because he was really <laughs> creating Scott Casimir. 
You know, that's what the rumor was, right? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of rumors around Casimir. But that was, yeah. that was the – Casimir was the first, uh, like, prospect that got traded that crushed me. Like, that was – because I didn't – Me too. I didn't, yeah. I've been into it, into the prospects forever. It's just because I used to go to my early games in New Haven. I'm from Connecticut, so – and they, they were the New Haven Ravens at the time. So they were the Rockies for a bit. They were the Blue Jays, Mariners, I think. But, like, I used to always see the Binghamton Mets come through and, you know, all, all those teams. So, like, I've always been into that. So it's, uh, yeah, Kessler was the first one that came through, and I was just like, damn. Stink. Yeah, that hurt me a lot. I really thought he was going to be – I'm like, why are you getting rid of this, this kid? He's going to be so good. Because Rick Peterson could fix <laughs> – uh, Victor Zambrano in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, still wait, I'm still waiting, Rick. <laughs> yeah. I believed him. I thought he would do it. <laughs> uh, no, this is awesome. Um, anybody else have any topics you want to talk about? I'm like, I love talking to you guys, but you know, I don't want to hold you up the whole night. Like I said before, I this is my forever. night. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can legitimately talk forever. Uh, oh, I did you see the story I put on Twitter today? No, I was a little out of it today. All right, I'll be right back. I'm I'm pulling a key. Oh, Joe's leaving. What do we do? Let's go into his storage locker. Uh oh, now we're going to talk about crayons. Uh, I don't have any crayons here. <laughs> so, how about that mint? Oh. Oh, Wait, everybody's God. taking a break. If we now it's gonna be Mark Club. How about we just do some Mad Libs? Oh, okay. <laughs> so right oh. here, oh, the wow. ball from the from the Futures game in 2013 at City Field. So the story: I went as a fan with my mom, and we got it was like 30 bucks because who the hell goes to the Futures game? Me, that's who. But it was like 30 bucks, and we sat two or three rows behind the third base dugout, which is Team World. Uh, so it's Team World versus Team USA. And Nimmo was in the game, and Rafael Matero, and Cindergaard. So they're like the Mets representatives. And at some point during the game, someone hit a you know, foul grounder near the dugout. And I stood up like, hey, throw me the ball. Dude flips me the ball, and it was Francisco Lindor. That's pretty awesome. Everything comes so, full circle. Full, full, full circle. Yeah. So I got a, got a ball from Lindora at the Futures game. Nice. Adam wants to know when can we do some meeting greets and autograph signings. I I know some people that are doing virtual signings. It's I don't think we could pull it off because the companies that do it have more than two people in the Q, you know like in their company QBC wise. I don't think we could do it virtually, uh-huh. but. Hopefully, you know, pandemic starts getting better and we can hang out at ball games and meet players and have a, a full live QBC again where we can have meet and greets and, and signings. I'm sorry. Yeah, I such know. A it's appeared, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. The, Q- the QBC is great. I mean – just think about it, like how the QBC started with like Keith and Dan and everything, where it's just like the stupid Mets refuse to have a fan fest, like the most absurd thing in the world. And, you know, the fact that they did it and obviously will be a part of it twice, right? Two or three times, I forget. Maybe it was three, but I, for sure it was two. And uh, no, I, I think it was great. And obviously the Mets brought the fan fest back now, so... And they did a good job with it, but there's no reason why there can't be two dogs in town to do, you know, different things throughout the year. The Fan Fest, you know, every January and the QBC could be a summer event or, or something like that. I'm yeah. sure we can do it like around um, All-Star Game, you know. Yeah. that That's usually a week the other players are off. There's stuff going on. You can, you know, maybe the Mets team up with us and we do something at the stadium, you know, as a watch along. You know, who knows? But um, me and Dan are open to anything, and we are really happy with all the support we get from everybody. Like, you know, Dave, Joe, um, anybody that's been on panels, been vendors, been you know, even just people that buy tickets to support it. 
we don't make any money off of it. You know, we make enough to get the event done and have a little money to start the next event. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, does anybody know, like, how the QBC really started and who it started with? Anybody? The first time, I, the first time I saw Shannon that, involved, from, right? Hmm? Was you guys were just talking. So it was me, Shannon from Mets Police, and Darren. And Darren had to bow out because of his license. You know, that's when he was just getting those license, so he didn't want to to uh, to conflict with anything. So basically, what me and Shannon were doing, we were trying to, you know, make the Mets do a fan fest, and we kept trying to push it and push it. They didn't blink. So we're like, damn, now we have to do it. And it's lucky that I have my production knowledge, so we were able to pull that off. Shannon did a lot of the background stuff. Dan came on. And then Dan, you know, learned what we were doing. And then eventually Shannon had enough of it. He couldn't just mentally deal with it any, anymore. And then it just became me and Dan. And then I'm not knocking my cousin, but once me and Dan were just the two of us, I felt like the QBC made that next leap and got better. And it was great that we had Darren with the support with the seven line throughout the whole thing. He always supported us no matter what. Then we had, you know, our friends that volunteered and with that, we ended up getting more friends and, you know, like Mark Healy, he brought you and Joe, you know, to do the panel. And then, you know, Dave came in to do the artwork. We haven't had Joker yet, but it was just, you know, everybody just loved being together. And, and it was amazing how, not really too amazing, but the Wolpons didn't see that. Even though SNY was sending talent to us and... SNY was sponsoring us and all those commercials that were on SNY, I was the one that directed, edited, shot, and put together. And I even had a star in one or two of them. So it was always a grassroots thing. And then we had to fight Yahoo, you know, with the cease and desist because they were trying to use the QBC as their, you know, while we're trademarked and then, you know, dealing with the Mets Fan Fest and everything. Like, I'm glad that they have a Fan Fest, and I'm glad they did it such a great job for the fans. I I still want to do something, you know, with the QBC every year. And who knows, maybe with this ownership that they'll embrace us more, you know. I'm hoping, um, and I hope it works out for everybody. But if we can't really do a big QBC anymore, we had our mission accomplished by making the Mets do a Fan Fest. Right. No, and that's. I mean, I went to the the first ever one, and and then like saw what it was all about, and and I to this day, like I didn't go to Fan Fest. I I was not there, but um, just the whole essence of QBC, it, it was just different. It was, I think, it maybe is because it was, and it wasn't that that it was small, especially when you guys did them for the first what was it two or three years at um, McFadden's. The first two it years, was a yeah. lot of for yeah. So there was a lot of people. It was always jammed. Like it was, it wasn't like that. It was like a small, intimate time, but it it, it felt like that. And it was a more personal thing. And it wasn't experience that I think the cost of it wasn't outrageous to get what you got. And it was always interesting. Like everything about it was always a lot of fun. The the vendors were. It was just a more of a one on one experience. It was more of something that felt genuine and not just like a, a, a put together thing, like to just make money and just have this done and appease fans. Like everybody who went there went there because they were a diehard Mets fan and like they got a great experience and it was, it's fun. And the whole, the way it was just set up was always smooth. It worked out well. And um, you know, it was, it was kind of like one of those things where I, I, I was devastated personally <laughs> like knowing that you didn't do it the one year. And I was like, damn it, man, that sucks. And like, I don't know, outsider's point of view, it kind of was just like, you almost feel like it got taken over by big business, you know, quote unquote, like the Mets came and did the fan festing, which in reality, like you just said it, like you kind of mission accomplished in a way you got them to do what, what every other team in baseball does. And they, they didn't, but you know, it, it was, I love the intimacy of it. I love the, the lunch with Keith Hernandez. That was just as great. Like, even if it's not, a full on fan fest, as long as you still do something that provides, I think fans with that more close 
interaction with the players is just awesome. And it gives a lot of people a lot of chance to really, um, you know, work together. And it was, like you said, everybody who volunteers and the vendors and, you know, artists with collectors and everybody else, it, it just, it was awesome. It's, it's definitely something that, you know, I want to see it continue. Even if there is a Mets fan fest, then there could still be a QBC. And I think it would still be just as, uh, as successful. Uh, that that makes me feel good hearing that, and you tell me that kind of stuff all the time, and I keep blowing you off. No, um, you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> but I I really think like the the last two QBCs was the ones that we really got it going. Like you know the one that Flexen was at, he just enjoyed walking around and hanging out with the fans, and you know he and I became pretty good friends and. Like Todd Hunley loved being around. When was the last time you heard Todd Hunley anywhere near Queens be, right. <laughs> before the QBC? You know, and yeah. then the, I don't know if you guys know this story, but when I was working on Gotham, um, Drew Powell came. I know, I know you guys, some of you guys met him. He was uh, sitting at the, um, in the green room with Hunley, and Hunley and his wife are looking at Drew, and Drew's looking at Hunley, and Drew – He's from Indiana, he grew up a Cubs fan. He watched Todd's father play, and he's like, oh, my God, that's Todd Hunley. I, I love Todd Hunley. Todd Hunley looks up. He goes, holy crap, you're from Gotham. Can I get an <laughs> autograph? <laughs> it's just like it, it was just like such a weird mixing of my worlds where I'm like, everybody's having fun. I brought the Gotham guys to come hang out because they're usually doing their Comic Cons, and they never get to experience a convention, you know, on the other side. And they told me that it was one of their most fun cons that they've ever been a part of and I've ever seen, you know, just being at. And like that and the, the next year, it really made me feel like we really, we really like hit something. And the fact that we couldn't grow on it kind of lit a little bit of a fire under me. So I'm dying to get back to, to, uh, having it live and doing something where we all can hang out again. Like I haven't seen Joe. I don't even, what was the last time I saw you Joe? Maybe a ball game or was it a Caroline's? Yeah, I don't yeah, even I remember. Think, no, I think uh, was Caroline's after a ball game. Yeah. But it's been literally that long either way. It yeah. Been, and yeah, the major pod one, I think that might've been it. Yeah. And then I haven't seen mad Joe in forever since uh, I picked up the TIFO and Joker, yeah. I haven't seen since uh, last year. What was it, February? Yeah, the the Mets uh, advisory board, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I miss actually hanging out with you guys. So it's the, the QBC. I don't get to see you guys. I get to wave as I'm running around, but I know every <laughs> single one of you guys are having fun being there. So that's <laughs> what it means to me. And then I pass out for two days. So <laughs> the the last QBC. I did 28,000 steps. So wow. that, that, should, that should tell you what kind of day it was. So um, Go Gooning yeah. never stops. <laughs> I'm running, yeah, I was running. I was running. I was running the panel room. I was running, making sure D-Hap was doing his stuff. I was dealing with the players coming in. I was dealing with uh, S&Y. And it's crazy. And I, I feel bad not being able to say, you know, hello to everybody, you know. Like um, Steve right here just said, the key is the close interaction with the players. QBC felt like just pl hanging out with the players. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's – I want everybody just – not even just hanging out with the players, hanging out with fellow fans where you can actually get to know somebody where you're not just sitting next to them with season tickets. You know, where it's just like, oh, look at that, you know, that game where you can actually make connections. And I think that was a big part of the QBC. Yeah, and I thought it was cool meeting people from like Twitter and stuff because you know I talk to so many people on Twitter, and then actually meeting people that you talk to, and it's just kind of all right. There's actually a real like you almost forget there's a real person behind like a Twitter account, and you know just having conversations with people that I don't really know. Like to me, that's I mean I guess I'm just personable in that sense that like I'm down with that, but like it was awesome to just like be at a place where. It was about the Mets run by fans and fans. It was all fans there, obviously. And certainly you had players walk around, like when Nimmo was there and everything, like they were just, you know, walking around, whatever. But 
no, to me, it was like meeting people that I've talked to online or just meeting people in general. Like uh, it was, it was definitely always awesome. Uh, it's like another thing through the QVC. I got to go to a crane pool's house, you know, and see what his collection was. I bought some things off of him, And then we did like, it wasn't branded a QVC event, but it was a media goon slash QVC event where we raised money to help with crane pool's kidney at, I catch the, I think we raised something like 3,000 or 3,200 bucks. Maggio did a painting. Crane pool yep. signed it. We, we auctioned it off. Um, my mom actually bought it down. And so it's down in my, it's down in my parents' apartment. I keep looking can at it. Can I like, get that back? <laughs> yeah. It's like, can I go hang that up? Um, but like, you know, knowing that we could do something like that to help Ed. And then, you know, later on we had that special, you know, that luncheon with Keith. You know, we had 130 fans there, but it didn't feel like there was 130 fans mm -hmm. there. It felt like you're right there with him. And he, you know, it was just a fun time. And seeing other people enjoy it, it, it makes me enjoy it. And I can't, like I said, I can't wait for another one. And, and you know, all you guys, you know, Joe, Dave, eventually Joker, you know, you guys are all going to be a part of it. And, that's one of the greatest things about it is the community that we keep building and building. And hopefully, you know, something will break that we can, we can do something and grow it, you know, more. And I, I think with, with friends and people that back the QBC, you know, we're going to be able to do it. And like today, I, I can't thank you guys enough for helping me test this out because we want to do a virtual QBC. We have a guest that might work out, which would be pretty cool. And, you know, I just want to see how I'm going to do it. I'm I'm actually going to have to be all day in each panel. I think we're going to do like four panels or maybe five panels. So for those like four or five hours, I'm going to be attached to my computer just running the show. And I don't know who's going to save me, but... <laughs> I just, you know, I, I just know, like, you know, you guys are going to be a part of it and, and be able to help me out with just the content, which. Yeah, I'm excited awesome. about it. I can't wait, you know. And like like you said before, you could do it at another time of the year from the Fan Fest. You know, you could balance it out. So I don't know what the best time of year will be in the future, you know. Um, like you said, maybe summer, all-star break. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, Joker, do you have anything to plug? Mm. My hat. <laughs> we didn't get hat. one. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a nice hat. It's the first time I'm wearing it. I, I like it. Um, you know. Now, Majo, did you see how well Joe was putting his stuff in, like his podcast and his S and Y stuff? That's how you have to promote yourself. I know. Learn from this uh, master. I know. Learn from this master. I so, got to lazy. <laughs> <laughs> You have become a young Padawan under Joe now. Right. All, All right. right. I got you. All right. Let's go. Mr. DeMeo. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe, do your plugs. You know. Yeah. Follow me on Twitter at TSL2Flushing. Um, check out my writing at SNY.TV. And check out my podcast, That's So Mess Podcast. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that good stuff. Uh, rate, review, subscribe, five stars. Uh, we read reviews on, on air every week and, you know, take questions on Twitter, which you can follow the Twitter account for the pod too, at that's so mess pod. And yeah, we do a pod every Tuesday and drop an emergency pod. If something warrants it, for instance, a trade for Francisco Lindor. So we hopped on and, you know, we usually do 45 minutes to an hour every Tuesday. And we did a, a 50 minute show on just the Francisco Lindor trade and kind of, everything that goes along with it so yeah no a, a lot of content coming and uh yeah can't wait to continue to help out qbc i mean qbc's uh, i always love participating in it and you know keith you're obviously a good friend of mine so you know i'm here to help you support you in any way you need anytime awesome thank you joe now mad joe you see what? look how professional that is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to see yeah. you at least nail one. Just nail one. That name, just there. 
that right there. But there's an the underscore, right? right? And that's how you find in it. Twitter. Yeah, right. in Twitter there's an underscore. Yeah. So at, uh, yeah, you see? I tried to wait. Is that my name? All right. Um, on Twitter, yeah, Dave underscore Majo M A J O, and then uh, that's that on Instagram. But that's I, I I don't. That's why I said I could never do this whole digital world, man. <laughs> I'm terrible with the. the, the you can do it. <laughs> I'm gonna try. I'm gonna really try. Maybe that'll be my resolution or something like that to actually push it more. But yeah, no, it's uh, try. I get I get. Sometimes nervous at posting artwork and stuff, and you know, you never know who's gonna complain about something or take something away. Or like a uh, like Joe and I were joking that the Mets were gonna send us a C and D instead of a hat. So, <laughs> you know, but uh, I thought it was in the hat. Like, uh, <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah. No, no day. Oh, that's your hat. And the slip fell out. I was like, oh man, I can't. Paint it <laughs> yeah, the slip. You had to flip over that note that's from Uncle Stevie. It said it on the yeah. back C and D for you. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, by the way, I'll knock it off. All right, sorry. But no, I, I, I'm not good at promotion of myself, and that's I think that's one of my downfalls. But I'm an artist, I'll blame it on that. That's that's all I can say. <laughs> you guys can find me at Media Goon, the Media Goon.com at QB Convention. Um, also, my podcast, Shark and Goon Podcast, which is a pop culture podcast. And you might be seeing me pop up here and there on YouTube and uh, the QBC Facebook page, just doing like these little shows until we get all the kinks worked out. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Almost an hour just yapping. And yeah. uh, and um, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you.